All right. Good morning, everybody. Happy, uh, as usual, happy Friday and welcome to this week's AMSSM Sports Ultrasound uh, case series presentation. Um, we are continuing for two more presentations with um, some very generous fellows, well, I guess now prior fellows that agreed to stick around and and present for us. So we are very thankful uh, for them uh, for doing this for us. Before I introduce our speaker, just one other point, uh, housekeeping points, like I mentioned, um, we have this talk this week. We're off as always next week. Return the following week on, on September, on July 23rd for our last fellows presentation, another week off after that. Um, and then we will start up the faculty presentation uh, portion of this like we did last um, last fall. So today um, we have Dr. Katie Bartolo uh, presenting here. She's she's coming to us uh, from from New York at a New York Presbyterian. She's just finished up her fellowship um, there, but for the purposes of this talk, we are pretending she is she's still a fellow. Um, she's she's originally from uh, from the Garden State, from New Jersey. She went to school medical school at Drexel uh, University. Followed by her PR residency out at Rutgers Kessler, um, and then, like I mentioned, she is was the current prior um, fellow, sports medicine fellow out at uh, Columbia, out in uh, New York, with doctors Disco and Maya Prady. Uh, next year, she is trading in her. I don't even know what colors it, what a Presbyterian is, but she's trading in those colors for. For Doug's favorite color, uh, Carolina blue, and she's heading down to uh, Chapel Hill to, to join that program down there. So, so with that, I will turn it over to uh, Katie to get started with her presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Cruz, for the introduction. Let's see here. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to thank uh, Drs. Cruz, Hoffman, and Hall for putting together this amazing ultrasound case series. Um, case series. Uh, all these presentations have been wonderful, and I've really enjoyed watching them, and I'm um, very excited to be part of it as a presenter. So today we'll be covering the posterior medial elbow region. <clears throat> I have no disclosures. So before we get started, I just wanted to take a moment. I did just finish uh, my fellowship and just wanted to express gratitude to my mentors at New York Presbyterian, Drs. Visco, Dr. Iafridi, and Dr. Suhu for their mentorship and guidance through my ultrasound training, as well as my mentors in residency at Rutgers New Jersey Medical School and Kessler Rehab for helping me develop a foundation in ultrasound on which to build um, in a fellowship. I also um, wanted to make sure that people are aware that Dr. Mockner did an amazing talk of the ultrasound of the elbow. It's very comprehensive. This talk that I'm giving today will not be as comprehensive. We'll be focusing on relevant pathology in the context of the presented case, as well as the overall uh, protocol for the posterior medial elbow. So I recommend that you check out Dr. Motner's talk for a more comprehensive review. So today our goal, as I mentioned previously, is to go review the official protocol to meet criteria for a complete ultrasound of the posterior medial elbow. We'll be reviewing ultrasound images of normal pathology in the posterior medial elbow to meet said protocol. We'll also be reviewing uh, ultrasound images of relevant pathology in the context of the case presented. And then lastly, we'll review the composition of a complete diagnostic ultrasound report for our case. <clears throat> so on to our case. So we have a 23-year-old recreational weightlifter. He reports symptoms that have been going on for about five years. He notes pain in the left medial elbow associated with numbness and tingling radiating down to the fourth and fifth digits. 
He knows that his symptoms are worse with prolonged elbow flexion and weight lifting, mainly with exercises such as chest press and triceps extensions. He notes improvement in his symptoms with rest, denies any known trauma, denies noticing any bruising or swelling in the area at any point, and he denies any concurrent neck pain. Lastly, his symptoms significantly limit his exercise due to uh, the pain with certain weightlifting exercises, and therefore he has had to limit his physical activity as a result. So on physical exam, inspection was normal. So he had no deformities, no swelling, no discoloration, no muscle atrophy distally in the hand, normal carrying angle. On palpation, he did note tenderness along the retrochondylar groove. Range of motion in the elbow was full um, for flexion and extension, as well as supination and pronation. For special tests, we did have a positive tenel sign at the retrochondylar groove. Sperling test was negative. And the neuro exam largely was normal, including strength with finger flexion at the DIP of digits four and five and abduction of the fifth digit. It did not have any sen sensory deficits and reflexes were symmetric. So here is the diagnostic ultrasound protocol. Um, the official one per AMSSM, and uh, you can read that here. And I just wanted to point out that the area in the red box here is the overlap with the posterior scan, which I eliminated on this slide here, uh, just for you to eliminate redundancy, but you wanna make sure that you're aware. Um, but overall, these two compartments really are very much related to one another. And so often you'll find yourself adding them together either way. Um, so just go ahead and take a look at this list, and this is what we, what we will be covering today. <clears throat> so just going over considerations before we start the scan. So as others have mentioned, it's important to consider your patient positioning. So in general, when I'm scanning the um, medial and posterior elbow, I'll have my patient lying supine. Just seems to be more comfortable for them and for me as well to be more ergonomic with my setup. However, if you notice that it's challenging for a patient to have their shoulder abducted to about, you know, 70 or 90 degrees, you can always have your patient lie on their side and essentially have their elbow in flexion, and that will still expose the area of the elbow that you need to scan. Uh, you want the shoulder abducted about at 90 degrees is what most people do, but sometimes patients also have shoulder pathology, so uh, you can also have it to a slightly lesser degree, but the goal just being you want to make sure you can get, you can access the part of the elbow that you want to scan. The elbow should be in some degree of flexion. Um, this will range depending on the structure that you're scanning, so anywhere from 30 to 90 degrees. So you can take a look here. This is generally how I do most of the scan, but then there's aspects of this of the um, protocol with certain structures that we'll get into where you'll want your elbow more at this 90 degrees. And you'll notice that the elbow joint is generally slightly hanging off the table, just slightly, to allow better access to the posterior medial area. Regarding the transducer type, we use a combination of two transducers. So your workhorse of the, um, the regular linear array transducer pictured here, as well, oops, back, um, as well as the high frequency small footprint linear transducer, which will be used for smaller structures, especially um, for nerves. And um, lastly, you want to use a generous amount of transducer gel in this area. There's a lot of bony prominences, so to um, to ensure that you have good contact with the transducer to allow for quality imaging, you want to make sure you have a strong gel interface. And lastly, I forgot to mention for patient positioning, when it comes to the posterior aspect of the elbow, traditionally it's described to have your patient uh, seated and having the hand positioned onto the table and pushing down so that you can access the posterior aspect of the joint here. However, I find it's just more time efficient most of the time to have my patient uh, bring their hand back to behind their head so that it exposes this posterior elbow joint and you're still having that elbow in some degree of flexion. You can have them extend it further here too. So to start us off, we will start with the common flexor tendon. So the common flexor tendon, as you can see here, is attaching to the medial epicondyle and it is shorter 
than the more frequently scanned common extensor tendon, so important to note there. And you'll want to make sure that you take a close view and close look at the uh, origin point here to evaluate for anesthesiophyte calcifications or anything like that. And so the area between the blue arrows here is going to be the tendon. And this uh, here you'll see there'll be a photo with a blue box, and the blue box denotes the positioning of the transducer. So I have a video here. And so just like everything else, when we scan a tendon, we wanna make sure that we're scanning along the full width of the tendon to not miss any pathology. So this video here is moving volar and dorsal to evaluate the full extent of the tendon. And we're gonna get most of our information from the longitudinal view, but it's important always to scan things into orthogonal planes. So here we're looking in transverse, so this one, this video here, with our medial epicondyle here, and this area will be our tendon and transverse. Moving on to the ulnar collateral ligament or the UCL with uh, significance in sports injuries. We often see this in our baseball pitchers. And so, uh, here you can see that the UCL, as we all know, uh, is comprised of three different bands. We've got our oblique or transverse band, the anterior band, and the posterior band. The anterior band is the one that we tend to be most focused on. It's the most likely portion to be injured, and it's one of the key stabilizers to valgus stress within the elbow. So this is an image of where we're looking at here on this um, illustration. And so you'll notice the uh, anterior band here spanning from the medial epicondyle down to attach on the sublime tubercle of the ulna. And you can notice it's a rope-like structure. It's very fibular. It can range from being more hypoechoic or hyperechoic depending on the surrounding structures, like everything else. Um, and so what's important to note is this is more taut with the elbow inflection as opposed to an extension. And you also wanna make sure you're evaluating the humeral ulna joint in this area with the UCL passing over it. This is important because sometimes you can get an effusion that's coming out more medially as opposed to in other areas of the joint. So then we want to evaluate uh, dynamically the UCL by applying valgus stress. So when I do this, I'll show this image here, or this video rather, of the, oops, of the transducer positioning. So positioning the transducer on there and we'll make sure that the elbow is essentially slightly hanging off and that the upper arm is being stabilized by the table. And then we'll have the patient with their thumb directed down and then I'll grab that, that thumb and direct it downwards towards the ground while stabilizing the transducer here, something to refer to as milking. So that's that. And then when we look at the scan, this is going to be our UCL that's crossing over the humeral ulnar joint here. So this is gonna be proximally and this is distally. And we're looking to see the integrity of the, of the fibers and looking to see if there's any widening of the humeral ulnar joint here, which in these videos, it's intact. So then moving on to our triceps tendon, our triceps tendon is the, um, the culmination of all three heads of the triceps coming down and inserting onto the olecranon. So once again, there's this illustration here showing you the main area where we're looking at. So we've got um, the humerus coming down and the olecranon and the triceps tendon attaching here with the transducer position demonstrated here for longitudinal and transverse. So here we have the triceps tendon coming down over here. It's important to note that this striated appearance is normal. This is due to intervening fatty strands between the tendon fibers. It's a normal finding and shouldn't be confused with pathology. And we wanna make sure we take care to carefully inspect the insertion point of the triceps that will be inserting down around the electron, but it curves. So we need to make sure that we adjust our transducer appropriately because the anisotropy is common in this area and we don't want to overcall um, any type of pathology. So we'll take a look at this video. This is looking at the triceps tendon in longitudinal. 
with a close, close inspection of that insertion on the electron. And you can see, here we go, my attendance junction coming down here and then insert, inserting on the electron. And then we will inspect the triceps tendon in transverse view. So here we can see this is the triceps tendon coming in, and this is the posterior joint space. We've got our posterior fat pad here with the hyaline cartilage. And we will watch this video here that will show us coming down from proximal to distal. And then towards the end of the video, please take note to look at that striated appearance of the tendon as it inserts down. So let's see here, triceps tendon coming down and then inserting on the electron on there. So the posterior joint space. Uh, so we'll, looking here again, we just reviewed, this is the triceps tendon inserting on the electron. This is the troclea. And then we have the humeral shaft here. And this region, this is our electron fossa with the, um, the posterior fat pad overlying. And uh, regarding the electron on bursa, this is a really superficial structure located in the soft tissues overlying the uh, electron on process. So as a result, it's really important to use this gel interface here that you can see, because if we are applying too much pressure with our transducer, it'd be very easy to displace the effusion, especially if it's a smaller effusion, and then it could be missed. And then uh, looking at this video again, it's the same one that we looked at for the triceps, but this time we'll be looking at it to uh, better evaluate the posterior joint space and the electron on fossa and fat pad. So you can see that coming in here is our fat pad and the electron on fossa coming through there. And that's our joint space right here. And so just like when we're looking at uh, radiographs, we're looking to see if there's any hypoechoic fluid or anechoic fluid in this area that's causing displacement of the posterior fat pad more uh, superiorly or superficially rather. So on to the ulnar nerve. So regarding, uh, we'll do a quick review of the ulnar nerve anatomy um, at the elbow. This will be important. Um, to uh, when it comes to scanning. So unfortunately this got moved, not really sure why, but anyway, this should be here. This is where our transducer will be located. And the uh, ulnar nerve passes through what we consider the retrocondylar groove. So this is going to be passing posteriorly to the medial epicondyle, which is here, and the olecranon, which is here, and it will pass down there, and then it will enter the cubital tunnel, which is denoted by a fibrous, tissue that has many names. So it can be called the cubital tunnel retinaculum, arcuate ligament, Osborne's fascia, Osborne's ligament. It has many names, but either way, it is this epineurotic tissue or thickened fascia-like tissue that spans from the medial epicondyle to the electron and then joins the two heads of the uh, flexor carpi onerus here and here, the humeral and the ulnar heads. And so I really like this cadaver um, picture that shows you this fibrous tissue joining the two heads. And you can see that this is the ulnar nerve that's passing beneath them. And so this is a transverse view of what we're looking at over here in illustration with our medial epicondyle, the electronon, we've got, we'll call it Osborne's ligament for simplicity's sake during this talk and the cross section of the ulnar nerve. So, to speaking to the cross section, this will be how we evaluate to see if there's evidence of entrapment. So when you're taking a cross section, you will try to draw um, around the hypoechoic portion of the nerve, but within the hyperechoic perineural tissue. And you'll be looking to see what it is in uh, essentially millimeters squared. And so research has uh, shown that in general, a normal cross-sectional area for the ulnar nerve is around six to seven millimeters squared. Um, but it's important to know that unlike with other nerves, on other nerves, it is expected that the ulnar nerve will be slightly larger with at the level of the medial epicondyle and the retrocondylar groove 
compared to slightly more distally and proximally still at the level of the elbow. This is an important point. However, um, there have been many studies and including a large meta-analysis by Chang et al. that described that essentially any cross-sectional area of the ulnar nerve that measures 10 millimeters squared or greater should be considered abnormal and enlarged. When in doubt, you can always compare it to the contralateral side, assuming they don't have symptoms on that side, because research has shown that there is no uh, significant difference between sides from dominant to non-dominant sides. You can use that as an internal control if needed, if it's not quite large enough to call, but you really have a high level of suspicion. And then we want to make sure that we take a look at our nerve and longitudinal. This is looking at it at the level of the medial epicondyle. And you can notice that here is this hypoechoic structure. It looks a bit like train tracks. And uh, this can be a tough nerve to scan in longitudinal because of its oblique winding course. Uh, so sometimes it's easier to use a larger footprint transducer. Either way, you're looking for notching, so regularity uh, along the uh, periphery here, or you can see hourglassing, which sounds like as it sounds. So you see that it's much wider, and we'll look at that on the next slide, and then much uh, thinner in a certain area that denotes uh, compression. <clears throat> so um, when we're scanning the ulnar nerve, we want to take a look at sp uh, specific areas. So this is pictures moving distally to proximally. So here we can see our ulnar nerve. It looks like that more classic honeycomb appearance that we're used to with those hypoechoic nerve fascicles and then hyperechoic perineural and intraneural tissue. Um, and so we've got the two heads of the, um, the FCU here and here. And then as we move proximally, we're going to start to see that Osborne's ligament kick in between the two FCU heads, the thickened tissue right here. And I just want to point out that it's normal to see fascicular rearrangement in the ulnar nerve at this region because the nerve is going to be moving around a bony prominence. Not uncommon to see the nerve go down to become uh, oligofascicular with too many large fascicles or even down to monofascicular at the level of the medial epicondyle. As with other nerves, we tend to think that that's definitely a sign of entrapment, but at the ulnar nerve, this is pretty common and shouldn't be overcalled as pathology, you'll need a little something else. Because it's pretty common to see it go down into this one hypochoic fascicle. So in any case, as we continue to move here, we'll continue to move proximally. And now we're at the level of the medial epicondyle and the electron on over here. You can see this large hypoechoic nerve that seems, appears to be a single fascicle. And then over here, we also have a posterior recurrent ulnar artery. You wanna just make sure that you identify that in case it's super close to the nerve, you don't want to include that artery in your cross-sectional area of the nerve. So it's just important to identify prior to taking your cross-sectional area. And then I just have a video here moving uh, from distally to proximally demonstrating a video of these photos. So you can see the nerves right here between the two heads of the FCU here and here. And we see that Osborne's ligament coming in and we follow it up. And we want to make sure that we stay in true cross-section to the nerve. If we're going to be taking a cross-sectional area, we don't want to be taking that when the nerves are weak. So dynamic scan of the ulnar nerve, the nerve can sublux over the medial epicondyle. So this is normal. Looking at our ulnar nerve right here, medial epicondyle is here. And here I am passively flexing and extending the elbow to see if this ulnar nerve is going to sublux over the medial epicondyle. We don't see that here. I apologize for the quality of this video. For some reason, it didn't save as well. But in any case, the ulnar nerve is here, once again, medial epicondyle. And as we're flexing, the elbow, we can see that this nerve passes over the medial epicondyle. It also seems to be flattening here. So this would be subluxation. There's another variation of snapping tricep syndrome, which you would see then this is the medial triceps passing over the medial epicondyle. This can occur with or without ulnar nerve subluxation. So sometimes it'll be like the ulnar nerve will sublux and then the medial triceps will sublux over the medial epicondyle. Other times the ulnar nerve will stay, stay in place and you'll see this uh, snapping triceps, medial, medial triceps passing over the ulnar nerve, which was demonstrated in Dr. Montner's talk. So back to our case. So 
uh, our weightlifter here, we took the cross-sectional area of the ulnar nerve here at the level of the medial epicondyle. So we have the medial epicondyle here and we took the cross-sectional area, which was about 12 millimeters squared, which we know is above our cutoff for abnormal, as I mentioned previously, is 10 millimeters squared. We also look here to see the medial triceps as well. And what's this? We'll go over that in a second, but there's a, you know, some kind of a muscular tissue located above the ulnar nerve here. And then when we scan further distally at the level of potential compression by Osborne's ligament between the two heads of the FCU, we know here that the ulnar nerve is located, is uh, measuring six millimeters squared in cross-sectional area, which is a significant difference from more proximally. And then um, when we go proximal to the elbow, we also see that it's around seven millimeters squared. So there's a difference between um, the level of the medial epicondyle and more distally and more proximally. And then longitudinally, as we look at the nerve here, we see our nerve here as this hypoechoic train tracky rope looking structure passing by the epicondyle. And then you can notice the difference in the caliber here in the diameter that it's much wider here compared to here. And there's also thickening of the perineural tissue in this area that is consistent with entrapment. And so you'll take a look at these lines here. There's a significant difference in that diameter. And this is what we consider hourglassing. So about the anconius epitrochlearis. So the anconius epitrochlearis is an accessory muscle located at the medial elbow. It spans from the medial epicondyle to the electronome process, essentially creating a roof above the ulnar nerve. It's an extra tissue. And essentially we saw what that what this area looks like, it's creating some crowding here. There, it's not designed to be there. And so it's pressing on top of the ulnar nerve and it's occupying space within this retrochondylar groove, potentially predisposing this ulnar nerve to compression. It is, um, can be seen from what I was reading in many case studies and also what I've seen in clinic can be very common in weightlifters because of the flexion and extension of the elbow. And so we can see here, this is the medial triceps and this is the ulnar nerve on the medial epicondyle. And then we'll see that this is the anconius epitrochlearis here. And then what you wanna do is you wanna try and get slightly oblique view so you can see that the trajectory of this of the orientation, I, I mean, of this anconius epitrochlearis, so this muscular tissue, it appears to be spanning across the medial epicondyle and to the electron, as you can see here. Oh, and I had a video here. So when you're trying to determine if it is truly an anconius epitrochlearis versus a slip of the medial triceps, you'll want to see that that anconius epitrochlearis is coming from what appears to be the Osborne's ligament as you're scanning distal approximately. So you'll see in this video, we're scanning distal approximal and we see Osborne's ligament. And then as we keep scanning proximally, all of a sudden this muscular tissue appears above it, kind of just bloop, comes in. And then as you continue to scan proximally, it then disappears and it's located right over the ulnar nerve. So take a look at this video. It's our ulnar nerve. And as we scan back proximal now to distal, you'll see this bloop, this little muscular tissue arriving between the two uh, heads of the FCU, and then it disappears as we continue to scan more proximally. So on to our ultrasound report. Um, as others have mentioned, we'll include the name of the patient, the day of the study, the examination, being an ultrasound evaluation of the left elbow. Uh, our indication would be medial elbow pain with numbness and tingling into the fourth and fifth digits and concern for ulnar neuropathy at the elbow, and that all structures were evaluated in longitudinal and transverse planes. So we'll review the findings here. So the common flexor tendon is normal without evidence of tendinopathy, tenosynovitis, or tear. The ulnar collateral ligament shows no evidence of partial or full thickness tears on static and dynamic evaluation. The humeral ulnar joint space did not widen with dynamic valgus stress. The ulnar nerve shows evidence of focal enlargement measuring 12 millimeters squared within the retrochondylar groove compared to um, this is a typo here, but compared to six millimeters squared distally and seven millimeters squared proximally, apologize for that, I left that in centimeters. Additionally, an accessory muscle tissue is visualized superficial to the ulnar nerve 
within the retrochondylar groove. We're going to leave our speculation um, or our overall interpretation uh, down to the impression here. So we're just going to describe it as accessory muscle tissue at this point in the report. And then continuing our report, there was no subluxation of the ulnar nerve on dynamic evaluation, and there was no posterior joint effusion in the electronog fossa, and the triceps was tendon was normal without tendinopathy or tear, and no electronon bursopathy was present. So to our impression, there is evidence of chronic ulnar nerve entrapment at the level of the medial epicondyle, likely due to the presence of an accessory and coneus epitrochlearis muscle causing focal nerve compression in this area. So my references. Thank you very much. Nice job, Katie. That was, that was a, a great overview. Um, some, some great images there. So thank you for Thank you for doing that. I, I have just a couple quick uh, quick points, and then I'm, I'm sure Doug will have some some nice points to make here. You know, with the Anconius, you know, one of one of my mentors when I was back at Mayo, you know, always said, "We see what we look for. We look for what we know. So if we don't know about something, we're not going to look for it. If we're not looking for it, we're not going to find it." And I think the Anconius kind of falls into that. Um, you know, certainly when I was going through training. You know, if I saw some relatively hypoechoic structure in that region, my mind automatically thought this was probably just the triceps and I blew it off um, and never really thought to comment on it. So it's just one of those things to always keep in mind um, when we're scanning this region. Uh, one comment on, on positioning. So, so my preference when I'm scanning the medial elbow or posterior medial elbow, I like to have them like you mentioned, um, uh, sideline and and you talked about the varying degrees of elbow flexion and I tend when I'm scanning these to really move the patient in in different degrees of flexion for different reasons. Um, I'll typically start off with around 30 degrees of elbow flexion. I, I feel like I can get you know nice images of of the common flexor pronator tendon of the ulnar nerve. I will start my UCL scan at 30 degrees of flexion. I will then rather quickly transition to around 70 or so degrees um, that somewhat came from, so Dr. Smith and uh, Dan Leaders, and I think Jake Sellen published a paper back oof, 2015 or so, um, <clears throat> looking at variable degrees of elbow flexion for ulnar collateral ligament uh, evaluation. And, and the, the preference amongst folks was about 70 degrees or so, and I tend to fall into that group. Um, so that's where I'll do my UCL scan. Uh, however, when I'm switching to my ulnar nerve scan, I'm going to bring them back out into a bit more extension. So around 30 degrees of flexion. And the reason being any more than that, you know, once you get to 90 and above, you could potentially cause ulnar nerve to, to ride high or, or sublux. Um, and, and, and so you want to, which can be uncomfortable for the patient. So I like to have them around 30, 45 degrees of flexion for my ulnar nerve scan. Um, the other point to make here, uh, and you made a great point on this, about using, you know, generous gel when you're scanning um, this region, in particular the ulnar nerve. We know that, you know, excess sonopalpation or sonal pressure in this area, you can uh, artificially or iatrogenically uh, keep the ulnar nerve located uh, posterior to the medial epicondyle. So you really want to float your transducer here so that you don't miss a potentially unstable um, ulnar nerve here. <clears throat> and then if you do see that the ulnar nerve um, is, is, is moving anterior to the medial epicondyle, I think it's important to, to comment on the type of motion that you're seeing, right? So if a lot of folks, you're going to see, you know, nice smooth motion as the nerve slides over the medial epicondyle, and that's not always symptomatic. Um, some folks will have a rather abrupt dyskinetic snap. And so I think, I think describing that um, in, in your report is, is important to help differentiate, like I said, you know, smooth motion versus, um, versus dyskinetic motion. Uh, that's, I think that's, that's all that I have. Doug, do you have anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I do have a, can you hear me? Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. I do have a couple comments. Nice presentation. Um, just I, my understanding of the anatomy is that Osborne's fascia, uh, uh, as you enter the so-called cubital tunnel, it spans between the olecranon and the medial epicondyle. And this fascia gives way to the arcuate ligament, which some people feel is a cubital tunnel proper. 
Um, but there's a distinction between Osborne's fascia and the arcuate ligament. And the surgeons know this as they do the release, they release the Osborne fascia, but they, they can see oftentimes the compression <clears throat> right at the arcuate ligament, it's tight. And then they release that uh, and essentially uh, split the flexor carpi ulnaris um, at that level. Um, just a couple comments about the protocol. So my protocol, which you had, as, as part of your demonstration is I do a proximal to distal short axis sweep because I want to look at that ulnar nerve in continuity as it goes from outside the cubital tunnel at the medial triceps in under Osborne's fascia, which is oftentimes where you see the enlargement and then go through under the arcuate ligament and into the FCU as you demonstrated. And I find that's a very important video to have and go back to review as you're looking at these. I also include the first dorsal interossei muscle um, in my protocol. Um, just like electrodiagnostic studies, uh, we always want to test muscles. And so in this case, we should look for, you know, the echogenicity as well as the size of the first dorsal interossei muscle when evaluating the cubital tunnel, as I do uh, the thenar muscle group when I'm evaluating um, you know, the carpal tunnel or any nerve. I always, when I'm evaluating a nerve, I'm always including the muscles. Um, you know, Anconius, you, you show a fairly large uh, Anconius, um, and, but even a large Anconius epitrochlearis muscle can be sometimes hard to distinguish between the medial triceps. Um, and that brings up the question, is a low-lying medial triceps as a cause of cubital tunnel syndrome? And it can be hard. And so it's the dynamic short axis images uh, that help you when you see the medial triceps uh, come um, with elbow flexion, um, whereas you shouldn't really see the medial triceps in full extension. And so if you see a muscle at full extension, it's most likely an anconius epitrochlearis um, versus uh, inflection, you're going to always see the medial triceps come in. And, you know, uh, low lying medial triceps is a cause of cubital tunnel syndrome. And to my knowledge, you know, this has not been well quantified. It's more qualitative uh, in the sense that in full extension, I really sh shouldn't see the medial triceps. Even in slight flexion, um, we, we sh really shouldn't see much of it. And in someone where there's some flexion and all of a sudden the cubital tunnel space is filled by the medial triceps, for me, that becomes a low-lying triceps. And the insertion of the triceps is fairly heterogeneous and complex. There's some direct muscle fiber attachments as well as the triceps tendon. So it can get tricky, but I think dynamic image, careful dynamic imaging and elbow flexion extension should be utilized to help distinguish an anconius epitrochlearis muscle from the medial triceps itself. Um, and then lastly, there was a question. Um, and the question was, you know, did you treat this condition? And if so, how, how was this treated? Sure. So um, thank you, uh, Dr. Spruz and Dr. Hoffman, for the additional comments. They're very helpful. Um, as regarding the treatment of this patient, so what we had done is we did do an intramuscular steroid injection uh, with the goal of essentially trying to capitalize on that side effect of steroid to cause muscular atrophy to see, since this, as Dr. Hoffman mentioned, was a large enconius, essentially uh, hypertrophied, most likely due to his weightlifting history, to see if we could atrophy that muscle slightly, if it would help relieve his symptoms. He, I did not get an opportunity to see him back in follow up, follow up after that uh, injection since I graduated, but it would be interesting to follow up um, in Dr. Visco's clinic and follow up with him to see how the patient is doing after that. When I did check the literature, it does sound like you can also have them go in and have it surgically released, uh, the muscle itself. So we'll see how he's feeling. Um, fortunately, his neuro exam was intact, but uh, it's possible that this could progress and then if it became more severe that we'd wanna look at it more surgically. Yeah, you know, in my experience, um, in a weightlifter, a younger person um, that will eventually go to resection um, of that accessory muscle. Um, so yeah, it would be interesting to see if an injection helped in this case. Hey, D Doug, I, it's Jay. I would, I, I want to make a few comments if I could. Yeah, that'd be great, Jay. First of all, Ryan, thanks for dating me. Would you say the paper was written like 15 years ago? I'm not, <laughs> I'm not like sure if you're, I'm not, I'm not sure if you're right, but uh, Katie was probably in high school when that happened, uh, but uh, I'm dated. I'm feeling old. 
Um, I think the uh, great job, Katie, and the the uh, presentation was was excellent. And Doug's comments and Ryan's were right on. I think the biggest struggle I have with the Anconius is trying to decide if it's symptomatic or not, right? I mean, it's really, you know, they can be quite large, they can be small, they can definitely be asymptomatic. And I think that reinforces what Doug said about the dynamic imaging part. You know, you got to put it all together and see, you know, is this muscle a problem? It was likely a problem in this person's case, but, you know, you, you sometimes don't really know. Um, I'd be interested, Doug, in the cases that you've had that have gone to resection, I mean, this guy is also at high risk for becoming unstable, right? You I mean, part of this anconius is it's, it's kind of creating a little bit of compression and a barrier. And if you resect it, which, you know, doesn't mean you shouldn't resect it if it's symptomatic that, you know, he's going to have another problem because his hypertrophic medial triceps is going to make it unstable. So he'll probably end up with a Ooh. transposition as part of his surgery. Um, but, but I think that's one of the things to just emphasize is that we don't really, know, it's really hard to tell whether these things are, simp are the cause or not, but, but it's totally reasonable to treat it as such, you know, as you, as you do it and try to put it all together. Um, and, uh, and I think the other thing I wanted to emphasize was Ryan, and I think Doug said the same thing. I, I keep the elbow generally straighter when I'm looking at the nerve itself, and then I'll flex it to look at the UCL and do the dynamic imaging because there's no... I mean, just from a practical standpoint, there's no reason to torture yourself trying to scan this ulnar nerve around a 90 degree curve by keeping the elbow at 90 degrees. You know, then there's also some data that suggests that you might um, change the shape and maybe throw off your cross-sectional area measurements if the ulnar nerve, if the uh, elbow is more flexed. So I agree with what was said that, you know, I'm doing my exam with the elbow 30 degrees or so flexed to look at the nerve. And then when I'm looking at the other things, I'll, I'll flex it up if I need to. Um, this person probably was never going to be unstable because his muscles keeping him keeping him in. I agree with all of that. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith. Yeah. So uh, I, have, I have a question. So, so Jay and Doug, for for you guys, when you're doing your dynamic scans for for the anconias, you know, Doug, you mentioned if you have, you know, the patient in quote unquote slight flexion, you know, then you should start to see, you know, medial head of triceps coming, coming into view. I mean, do you have a rough estimate in, in your mind? I know we don't have, you know, qualitative measurements here, but a rough estimate of when you would expect at what degree of elbow flexion that you would probably start to see medial triceps. Yeah. You know, good question. And, and, Again, I, I it, it is very subjective, and, and as Jay pointed out already, that I mean we frequently see the ulnar nerve effaced in elbow flexion from the medial triceps in a completely a, asymptomatic person. Um, that's just in a sense normal anatomy. So how do you decipher whether a low lying triceps is is a true cause of of compression of the nerve versus not? Very very difficult. Oftentimes the clinical history, you know, my el my elbows in flexion. And I go numb and then I extend it and it and it feels better. And you don't see another cause of the cubital tunnel syndrome. Um, all I can say is that, you know, of all these I looked at, I rarely see the medial triceps in extension. I tend to see a little bit as I bring them into maybe 20 degrees of flexion, but if about 20 to 30 degrees of flexion, if most of the cubital tunnel is being filled by the medial triceps, then I'm starting to think this is a low-lying triceps. But again, it, very subjective. Um, and, and sometimes it, it, I think what Jay just mentioned that the anconius can be very thin and, and can be mostly tendinous with just a few muscle fibers. And so it can be challenging sometimes to know that. And, and again, challenging to know if that accessory muscle truly is a cause, you know, in this patient, he's presenting as a clear abnormality and, and, and as a weight trainer, we see this fairly large muscle. Um, and so, um, again, it's probably the cause, um, but, you know, and there weren't other causes. The, the most common other abnormality that I see, and, and there's a variety of abnormalities that are called cubital, cubital tunnel syndrome, but the most common one, in addition to what we just talked about, is osteoarthritis of the elbow and causing bony hypertrophic changes and or joint effusion at the um, posterior medial ulnar humeral joint. And you'll see that fill the cubital space. And so in this case, we know we have the absence of it. So again, going back to your question, Ryan, I, it's very qualitative. I don't know, Jay, if, if you have a, a sort of a different sort of approach to when a medial triceps is low-lying. 
No, I agree. I mean, I think I, I, I look at it, I, I do the dynamic scan and try to sort out whether I think it's an Anconius epitrochlearis or medial head or, or both. And I say that um, I do the dynamic scanning and just describe what I see, you know, a little bit of art history, you know, medial head of the triceps looks like it's pushing on the nerve and and uh, that might be a that might be um, the morphological um, substrate for dynamic compression, but it's kind of like the low lying pronus brevis, right, for the posterior lateral ankle. I mean, you, you you could torture yourself in the literature trying to decide when to call that, and I think we all have have our own way of deciding when it's low lying in terms of um, potentially predisposing to peroneal instability. But but yeah, I think you should just call it the way you see it. I think I, I'm not uh, you know. To, to straight answer the question, I'm not aware of any data to suggest when it would be, when it would be a distal medial head or not. So I just basically say there are, you know, there seems to be, there's direct fiber, muscle fiber attachment to the olecranon. It's, you know, appears to be on the large size without having any criteria to call it large. <laughs> so. Right. Yeah, it's interesting Great. how much variability there is in this. So I read a lot of literature preparing for this talk. And even when it comes to the discussion of the Osborne's fascia, the cubital, the cubital tunnel retinaculum versus the arcuate ligament and Osborne's ligament, it was very hard for me to find a consensus in the literature in general. So I checked many of our books that we look at. I looked at Strakowski's book um, and I looked at Dr. Bianchi's book and, and then I looked and read papers and it seemed like in general, there wasn't a full consensus. Every, not everyone could agree, you know, what was considered what and what was called this. And then I read the paper by Dr. Osborne. And so it was really helpful for me to hear Dr. Hoffman, um, how you prefer to describe it. And so I think that's how I'll most likely be doing it moving forward. It was helpful to get uh, a little bit more of a consensus from you about that because it was a confusing area for me. And I think in general too, looking at the literature about the Anconius, there, there's still a lot of questions about it from, you know, is it is it a result of there not being that cubital tunnel retinaculum and it's a replacement to potentially try and help stabilize that ulnar nerve or not? So it seems like an area we still have to learn a lot about. But I really appreciate all of the attendings for their uh, their comments to help me continue to grow and learn in this area. Yeah, I'll just make one final comment. I, I agree with Doug's terminology, and I think you know, just a I don't know wisdom style type of thing is if if I was it depends on the audience you're talking to. You know, if you're gonna if you're you could you could find out really quick if you're talking to someone, and it's typically going to be a surgeon if they're going to talk down into that language. And if, and if you are into that specificity, I talk about it in the same terminology Doug talked about it. The reality is most of the time when the surgeons operate, they're cutting all the stuff, right? They're just gonna release it proximal to distal. They're gonna you know, leave nothing behind. And so every, they, there are many people that just lump it all into, they call that all cubital tunnel syndrome or ulnar neuropathy at the elbow would be more appropriate. But, uh, so I think it's important for all of us to know the anatomy in the detailed way that Doug said, and then you can you can you can go to that specificity if you need to. It just depends on who you're talking to, you know. But you'll you'll talk to people who don't really care, or maybe they don't know that detail, and it doesn't really matter. Um, and, but but it's always it behooves us to know it just in case you're going to be talking to someone who's going to ask you specifically where do you think it is, and you can tell them where you think it is, and you can give them the anatomical um, uh, language the way that they're expecting to hear it. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Jay. So great, great job, Katie. Uh, Doug and Jay really appreciate the, the expertise, the discussion. I think it, it adds significantly to these talks just to hear different perspectives um, and thoughts behind all of this. So, so thank you both for, um, for, for chiming in here, it's it's really great. Um, and, and and to be fair, um, I said you published in 2015. I didn't say 15 years ago. So just to, <laughs> no, that's just right. to be just to be clear. Um, uh, all right, good deal. Um, we will end it there again. Off next week, we'll return on the 23rd. Uh, Ali Warwick, who is the uh, graduating or prior uh, UC Davis fellow, she'll be talking about some lateral knee pathology. I think it's a uh, distal IT band syndrome potentially, um, unless that has changed. So again, that'll be on 723. 
Otherwise, Katie, great job. That was that was that was really well done. You stimulated some fantastic discussions. So so kudos to you for doing that. And um, thanks again for for doing this. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. All right. Happy Friday, all.